We, we, we talked last week, but in case you weren't here, about some different myths about mental health. I want to just recap those briefly in case you were gone. What are some myths that are out there about mental health that we really need to expose? Number one is, is this. Here's a myth. Struggles with mental health is a sign of sin, weakness, or a lack of prayer. That, that's a myth. Absolutely not. Right? Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you lack faith or, or you're not in prayer or you're living in sin. Obviously, if, if we are living in sin, it will impact how we, how we think and feel. But oftentimes, people navigate anxiety and, and, and depression through no fault of their own. Maybe they face some loss. Maybe they face some trauma. Maybe their life has thrown a curveball. They're going through some overwhelming circumstances right now. For some people, there's some physical, genetic things at work. And can we agree that culture doesn't make it easy for us in this area, right? Culture isn't doing us any favors. And so, so that is a myth. The second myth is this. Christians shouldn't struggle with mental health. Some people can think, well, man, I, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. I, I, should, I shouldn't battle worry. shouldn't battle anxiety. Should, shouldn't feel bummed out. Man, he, he, here's what we know. We live in a fallen and broken world right now. One day we will be in heaven and we will have perfected bodies, amen? But we are not there yet. This side of heaven... We live in a fallen, broken world. Our bodies, our minds are subject to brokenness. And so we are going to have to navigate these things. And, and if we're here and we're, we're navigating these challenges, we're actually in good company. Because there are very spiritual people in the Bible who navigated these things. David, okay, Ash mentioned him, is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. That's a pretty sweet description of your life, isn't it? And yet he battled despair and discouragement. The prophet Jeremiah used of God, yet, yet he battled loneliness. Okay, in my, in my personal opinion, this is just, I guess, the N.I. me. My personal opinion is, is Jesus in his humanity. He was fully God, fully man. In his humanity in the garden when the cross was on the horizon battled feeling overwhelmed because he had hematridosis, which is when he sweat drops of blood. And so if we're navigating these things, it doesn't mean we lack faith. It doesn't mean we're not a, Christ, not a good Christian. It doesn't mean uh, that we're not close to Jesus. It simply means that we're human, which we all are. The third myth is this. Churches shouldn't talk about this. That's a myth. Yeah, what, what, what do we say last week? The church needs to be a place where it's okay to not be okay, right? If there's anywhere in the world where it should be okay to not be okay, it should be in the church, right? So last week we talked about anxiety. Today we're talking about our thought life and, and overthinking. Just a few weeks ago, there was this super nice gal in our church and she emailed me. And she apologized for an interaction that we had. And so she shot me this email and she said, I just, I, I just wanted to email you. We had this interaction and, and I, I felt bad about it. So just, I wanted, I wanted to apologize. And, and, and I get this email and, and I can't even remember talking to her. So I shoot her an email back. I said, hey, listen, it is no problem at all. It's, it's not a big deal, to be honest with you. I don't even remember having this conversation. Like, so it's, it's honestly, no big deal. Don't stress it at all. And I, I click send and off it goes. And then a little bit later on that night or the middle of the night, whenever it was, it hits me that I had a full on conversation with her just a couple of days earlier. And what do I start to do? I start to overthink it. I start to think that she's thinking, is our pastor that forgetful? <laughs> like, like we had a full on conversation two days ago and he doesn't remember that? 
Obviously, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't even remember when we talk. I'm thinking that she's thinking I must be some loser of a pastor. And so I see her on a Sunday and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Yes, I remember the conversation. She says, oh, you were doing what I was doing. Yes, overthinking. And overthinking can take on many different forms, can it? It can be us getting in a mental loop and just staying there. It can be dwelling on, internalizing, and believing lies that someone has said about us or that someone has said to us. I think it can also be dwelling on and reflecting on lies that we tell ourselves, that we speak about ourselves. How about this? Can it also be analyzing from every possible angle what someone said to us, trying to figure out what did they mean by that? What, what, why did they say that? Did you see the look on their face? Right, just from every, and we can just find ourselves feeling overwhelmed and kind of imprisoned with our thoughts. L -l 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 Listen to this. Okay, neuroscientists say the average person has around 70,000 thoughts in a day. 70,000. It, it almost, it sounds overwhelming, doesn't it? 70,000 thoughts in a day, which means in a given year, we will have around 25 million thoughts. How exhausted are we going to feel if we overthink and analyze every one of those 25 million thoughts. And yet, a lot of us navigate this. If I'm being candid with you, of these five different topics that we're looking at in this mental health series, this is probably the one that I struggle with the most. I can overthink, I can, I can overanalyze, I can get in that loop. And I don't think I'm alone, listen to these stats. 73% of 25 to 35-year-olds overthink. 73%. 52% of 45 to 55-year-olds overthink. And 20% of 65 to 75-year-olds overthink. So, so the good news is, it seems to get better as we age, although my wife made a joke, it's maybe it's we forget more as we get older. Maybe that's it. So there's, there's good news on, on the horizon. So hey, here's the big idea for the day, the day, if you're taking notes, here it is, here it is. If we're going to have a joyful life, we need to have a joyful thought life. If we're going to have a joyful life, we need to have a joyful thought life. Listen, the, the human mind, the human brain is, is amazing. It, it is made up of 100 billion neurons. Our brain is made up of 100 billion thousand miles of blood vessels. Okay, and every mind and brain is uniquely different. You are unique. You are beautiful. You are created by God. There is no one else like you. There is no other mind like yours. This is the awesomeness and the wonder of God. In fact, I would say this, the, the humanness of humanity, it's called the anthropic principle is one of the major evidences for God. When you look at how God has created humanity, we can think, we can reason, we can feel, we can express emotion. The, 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 the Bible says that, that thinking just, just helps spur on our spiritual growth. So our mind is a beautiful gift from God, but this side of heaven, it is subject to brokenness. And so how does the Bible encourage us in this? Well, if you have your devices or your Bible, would you turn with me to Philippians chapter four? Philippians four, verses eight through nine. It's also gonna be on the screen where it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
whatever, you've, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And I love the, the last part of verse nine there. It says, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul is writing, we're somewhere around AD 59 to 61. And Paul is writing to the Philippian church. And the Philippian church is one of the best churches in the New Testament, probably. And Paul is in prison, on trial, in what would bring either life or death. He's likely under house arrest in Rome. And so think of the reality of his outer circumstances, yet he is writing and speaking from the mindset of an overcomer. And so he says what? He says, finally. So he, he is, he is kind of coming in for a landing in his letter to the church of Philippi. He's, he's encouraging them all these things. He's coming to the end of his letter. He says, finally. And what does he choose to encourage them with towards the end of his letter? How we think. Our thought life. Because how we think in our thought life is critical to the Christian life. And so let's just kind of just detail. Well, what, what do these words mean and how can we be encouraged by them? He says, whatever is, is true. That word speaks of dependability or, or loving the truth. The Bible says in John 8 that Satan is the father of lies. It's in, it says in Revelation that, that he is the accuser of the brethren. And so what we need to know was we have an adversary who is real. We have an enemy who is real and he is a liar. He is an accuser and he loves to throw those fiery darts of accusation and untruth our way into our minds. He wants us to think on lies. He wants us to believe lies. Lies like I'm worthless. Lies like no one cares about me. Lies like I'm not valuable. Lies like why, why did God make me like this? Lies like my past defines my future. He wants to just flood our mind with those untruths. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians that we need to put on the, the armor of God. And what is a key part of the armor of God? The belt of truth. The belt of truth. It's a key part of the armor. It actually holds everything together. In a Roman soldier's belt, it wasn't this flimsy leather thing. No, it was big. It was strong. It could hold other parts of their weaponry. And it had a protective piece across the front. Truth is strong. The truth of who we are in Christ. The, 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 the truth of God's word is strong and powerful and it can combat the lies of the enemy. He says, think on gospel truth. So, secondly, he says, well, whatever's, whatever's noble. That, that, that word means, means uh, worthy of respect, elevated, majestic. I just like this. It means awesome things. I just, I just like that. It means awesome things. He said, man, think, think on truth. Man, d don't get caught up just thinking of lies. No, think on awesome things. The future and the good things that God has on the horizon for our life. Man, purpose to think on those awesome things. Whatever's right. Some of your translations might use the word just there. I like what this means. It, it means seeing things from God's perspective speaks of seeing things from God's perspective. I think we need to see others from God's perspective. But you know what I also think is true, guys? Uh, again, in this whole conversation, we need to see ourselves from God's perspective. I think sometimes we can have what is called over-responsibility of thought to where we think, well, uh, th these thoughts come into our mind and maybe we can't control them. And we think, man, well, why would I have those thoughts? How can a Christian have those thoughts? God must be displeased with me. God must be mad at me. And that's not true. In those moments, we're not seeing ourselves from God's perspective. The Bible says in Psalm 103 that, that he knows how we are formed. He knows that we are dust. 
the fact that we're human does not catch God off guard. He created us, right? So see others and see ourselves from God's perspective. Think on, think on those things. What does it say next? Pure. Purity is, is a word and a concept that has become a little lost in our culture. It, uh, that, that, that word literally, literally speaks of clean, modest, or, or not being consumed with earthly lust. Listen, the, the, the average teen will see 14,000 sexual references on TV in a year. What, what, what impact is that having on our mind and purity? And I think we gotta ask ourselves, are there any areas of my life that I need to kind of just confess and bring into the light so I can walk in the purity and the promises that God has for me? A number of a few months ago, we did this series called Let's Talk About It. And we just thought, let's just, what are the, the, the cultural topics of the day? What are people talking about? What are people wrestling with and struggling with? And how can we just see what the Bible says about those things? And they're on our YouTube channel if you want to check them out. One of those was the reality of living in a porn epidemic. The impact of porn on, on culture today and the impact of porn on the church today. Josh McDowell is this really uh, famous, highly regarded author. And, and he spent $300,000 to do a study on the impact of porn in the church. And, and he, here is what he found. 79% of men who attend church view porn once a month. 79% of men who attend church view porn once a month. And, and I think it's possible for, and again, I, I think it's not just guys, it's also gals, but it's predominantly a guy challenge. I think it's possible for someone to say, well, what's the harm in it? It, it is, dev the effects of porn are devastating. It deadens a person's desire for what is real. And it drastically impacts decision-making. The, the, there's something called hypofrontality. Hypofrontality is, is a loss of blood to the free frontal cortex of the brain. And that's the area where you make decisions. It's your decision-making. And, and it impacts a person's ability to make decisions. And there are two ways that you get hypofrontality, a head-on collision and active porn use. That's how drastic it is. I, I had a guy and he, he reached out to me and said, Jeff, I'm, we, we did coffee and he said, I'm just, I'm caught up in, in porn. And, he, and, and this is the hole that had on him. He says, Jeff, I will look at porn on my phone and I'm just weeping while I'm looking at it. That, that's a hold that it had on him. We were to talk, I was able to connect him with his campus pastor, covenant eyes and, and all that. And, and, and he would tell you that bringing it to light was a key for his victory in this area. See, th th there's no way that we can think on things that are pure if we're filling our mind with porn. And so here's what I want to just, just say, just hopefully just in love as your pastor, three things. There's hope, there's help, there's healing. There's hope. You didn't need to feel like, well, this is just my lot for life. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm just destined to struggle with this the rest of my life. No, there's hope. Because we serve a powerful God, amen, who can break strongholds 
and bring freedom and health in this area. There's hope. There's help. You don't need to struggle alone. The enemy loves it when we struggle alone. He thrives when the people of God are isolated. You don't need to struggle alone. There, there's help. There's the body of Christ. There's men and women of God to come alongside. And there's healing. Healing over your life. Healing over, over your marriage. Healing as we seek to experience God's best for our life. So I encourage you. I plead with you. Let's come alongside and let's believe God for greatness in the area of, of purity. Amen? Amen. Next is, is lovely. That, that word is, is a word spoken only of here in the New Testament, and it, and it means pleasing, attractive, and thoughts flowing with compassion. Admirable means, means speaking well of or, or worthy of praise. And then Paul, almost in an effort to kind of just, just kind of wrap it all up, says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on those things. And so what is a few like just points that we can rally around here as we seek to really uh, have, a, have a positive, healthy thought life? Here they are. It's filter, focus, and feed. We're going to talk about each of those for just a moment. Filter, focus, and feed. It begins with number one, filter our thoughts. Let, let me tell you what I'm very thankful for. I am thankful for the spam filter on my cell phone. And what I mean by that is this, I, when I receive a call and it alerts me to spam, I'm so thankful, I just don't answer it. I'm thankful for that filter. Now, I, I don't stress that I received the call. I don't feel bad that the call came in. I just simply use the filter and choose not to pick up the call. What does the Bible say in, in, in 2 Corinthians? It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Meaning, we can't necessarily control what thoughts come into our mind, but we can take them captive. We can filter it and say, listen, I'm not picking up that call. I'm using the filter and I'm not answering that call. We're going to filter our thoughts. Secondly is this, we're going to focus on truth. Filter and then focus on truth. I, I just, my, my parents' gold retriever dog of what a 14 years, somewhere around there, passed away five, six months ago. And, and it was kind of around Christmas time, whatever it was, we're talking about it. And, and the thought crossed my mind to get them one of those 3D crystal things where you take a pic, you submit a picture and they create this crystal ball and it has like a picture of their dog. And I thought that might be kind of a fun little, you know, a significant gift for them at Christmas. I didn't end up doing that, but I did just a bit of research. My heart was in the right place. I just did a bit of research, just a little bit online. And what happened after I researched just a little bit for that, that little picture ball thing, for months, I mean months, every time I opened the internet, what did I see advertisements for? That 3D crystal ball everywhere, every time, for months. It wasn't until months later that I paid it no attention that all of a sudden it kind of started to go away. Well, what, what, what's the point? What we focus on often brings more attention to. What we focus on often brings more attention to. So if I'm focusing on the good thoughts, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, those get my focus. It brings more attention. So how do these bad thoughts die in our mind, we don't give them attention. They don't get our focus. That's how they die out. It's a little bit like if someone says, hey, I'm looking for a red sports car. What do we all of a sudden notice? Red sports cars when we're driving around. What we focus on brings more attention to. Then lastly, number three is this feed with the biblical text. 
So I, I, I filter, I focus, and then I feed with the biblical text. Just, just feed myself with the Word of God like Psalm 1, when I love it. Blessed, blessed is a man who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose life does not wither. Whatever they do does what? Prospers. We talked about our, our mind. Um, there's this thing called dendrites. These, these short tree-like uh, parts of our neurons in our brain. And on the right, we have an unhealthy neuron. On the left, we have a healthy neuron. And those on the end of these 100 billion neurons are these things called dendrites. And they look, like I said, like these short little trees on the end of all of our neurons. And they are responsible for sending and receiving uh, information to help the brain operate the body, the rest of the body. And it's so interesting when you study dendrites because they operate much like a tree. If there's a tree and it's not watered, it's not nourished, it's not cared for, it will eventually die. Now, it, it will still kind of look somewhat like a tree, but you recognize it as a dead tree. Are our dendrites in our brain and then of our neurons? If we are filling our mind with unhealthy thoughts, negativity, the, the dendrites appear like dead trees. There's no life and, it, it, you know, figuratively speaking, foliage and they're just like dead trees. On the opposite, when we're thinking on truth and grace and positivity, that sends energy and impulse to our neurons and to our dendrites. And when we're thinking on those things, that creates dendrites like on the left that are full and healthy and strong. And so as we do these things, it creates new neural pathways in our brain as we're focused on these things. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Neuroscientist Dr. Carolyn Leaf said it takes 63 days to change our brain, to change our thought patterns. And as we think on truth, what's amazing is science kind of is catching up with what God has already said in his word that our, our mind can be renewed. And in fact, healthy dendrites create other healthy dendrites. Our mind can be renewed as we think on things that are true. And so let's live out God's word to say, God, I'm gonna think on those things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. I'm gonna elevate my mind to think on awesome things. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive and active. Thank you that it speaks to us right where we are. Lord, I just pray for healing over people today. It's so easy for us, God, to get caught up in lies, caught up in those things that are not true. But, but your word today is encouraging us not to allow those thoughts that we can't control to be our focus, but to think on awesome things, think on elevated things. So I pray that you would help us with this. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here navigating impurity, 
that you would give them the courage to reach out to, to Pastor David or one of us pastors to come alongside of them. Lord, we just commit this to you and pray that you would cover our minds for your glory. Thank you that you are with us and you are for us. And, and God, we also just as, as a church family, God, we continue to lift up the nation of Israel today as they are facing these, these senseless uh, bombings. God, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would cover them. We do thank you that, that many were, were knocked down. 90 something percent, we thank you for that protective cover. And we pray continued wisdom, discernment, and victory for Israel, for your people. So we just lay those leaders before you and pray to fill them with your direction and your insight for your glory. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen.